All right, good afternoon, everybody. I am Kirsten Paris with She Spark Society, and today we are going to be interviewing our very own founding member, Abby Gibson, who's with us today. Um, Abby uh, is a guru with short term rental investor clients. I think it's super applicable across all the markets. So we'll just dig in. Abby, thanks for being here. Can you just give us a quick rundown on you when you got into real estate? You know, the whole nine. Yeah. Um, I've been in real estate coming up on three years. So a little bit, a little bit of a shorter run there. Um, but I've had a lot of success in the first few years and uh, a lot of that's due to working with investor clients and really finding some stride with, with them. And, you know, they they tend to be multiple buyers, which is really nice. By multiple buyers, you mean they buy more than one property? Correct. They buy you know, build their investment portfolios, sometimes short-term, sometimes long-term, sometimes medium-term. Um, sometimes they're buying primaries a couple of times. So depending upon the buyers, you know, they, they use a, a variety of, of tools to get to where they want to go. And how did you get into this niche? Um, Cause it's my passion <laughs> because I am an investor myself. I uh, just turned all of my or the goal of mine to get a certain number of properties to turn them over to a property management company. And we're doing that this month, which feels really good. We're going to buy at least one more this year, maybe two, um, considering our options with buying another primary and moving into that. So we can put as little as three and a half percent down or just going ahead and buying a great investment. Um, now that I've been an agent for enough amount of time, we can use my income to just have the loan in my name. You can have a certain number of loans in everybody's name if you're going conventional lending. So I can have five for Franny Freddie and my husband can have five. And once you hit yeah. 10, you have to get outside of the conventional lending um, world, which, you know, if you buy one every year or every two years, you'll have 10 and you should start being able to pull equity out of them enough to buy more. Yeah, that's a good point. So working, and, and you talked about different types of investors, short-term, medium-term, long-term. Do you find that you have niched down specifically in short-term or do you do you typically just work with investors across the board? I will say investors across the board. My preferred, my true avatar buyer, and, and one of them is actually on this call, would be somebody who's kind of in the move up category, ideally a woman who um, is looking to build wealth for her family long-term. And a lot of times that looks like a long-term investment, buying a home, moving into another home a couple of years later, turning that into a rental and doing that a couple of times. But once you start getting kids in the mix, that gets really complicated and yeah. really difficult. So you kind of have to start going pure investment route in order to not have any keep with your family. Um, and our area is so well known for short-term rentals. They do so well. And we're not as saturated as a Gatlinburg or some of these mm -hmm. other, you know, high desirable short-term rental places that you can still really make money in hours as long as you're doing it right and have realistic goals. So how is it, um, how do you, what do you think the biggest differences are from working with a traditional primary home buyer versus working with an investor? It's all about the numbers. With an investor, it's all about the numbers. They might see the property. They might not see the property. Um, they might buy from across state lines without actually going in. And you might virtually tour for them. Um, they also will run numbers, whether that's cash on cash, ROI, NOI. There's a couple of different ways to run it. It's really niching down and saying, okay, what are your goals? Are you cash flow? Are you appreciation? What are your long term goals? How do we vary across the different rental spectrums to diversify your portfolio? So, if short terms really take a hit for a couple of years, which they're doing now, they were incredibly hot during COVID. We're talking like 80% occupancy. People were making a ton of money off of them. But a more traditional occupancy rate in our area is like 65 to 70%. So if you're running, if you got in 2020, 2021, you may have paid more 
and your numbers I think you're right might not be as good because we're at kind of a I wouldn't say saturation point but there's a lot mm -hmm. of them in there that need to get kind of flushed out um so we're we're on a down slope we're seeing a lower occupancies than people might have expected and run their numbers on just makes it really important to work with an agent that understands investment because if you run your numbers at a number that perhaps you pulled a HELOC, perhaps they pulled equity out at a three and a half, four percent rate. Well, now that HELOC is a variable rate interest and mm -hmm. they're looking at seven, eight percent, and those numbers don't work anymore. Yeah. Maybe the occupancy is not at 80, which they pulled it out. So you know, some agents will sell homes to sell homes, but I think the good investment agents will say, okay, which one is a lower number or lower occupancy and make sure it still works and then just let the cash on, the cash that comes after that be gravy on top. So you answered my next question, which was, what value do you provide as a specialized investor agent um, on top of, you know, you know, the rest of us out there that are mostly working with primary home buyers? And I think you just answered a lot of that, but if you have anything to add in, that'd be great. I think it's knowing a lot about the lending products that are out there, the DSCR, what it takes to get somebody under with a debt service ratio loan. Um, how to leverage a HELOC and how to make sure you're leveraging it appropriately, um, whether or not you should be putting things in LLCs immediately or going later to quick claim them. You should have a decent understanding of how a 1031 works, what tax implications might be down the road. There are some um, uh, equity zones. That's not the word for it. Opportunity zones. Those are, can be tax shelters. You can 1031 money into that. And if you don't sell it, for 10 years, that tax liability is gone. So being really interested in the lending and the investment side and the portfolio growth side um, can be extremely helpful. And then honestly, investor agent, it's helpful to have a thick skin because you get it, you get buyers that aren't always loyal. You get buyers that are looking for a deal, looking for the way to spend the least money, to have the ease the the best transaction and they might go shop somewhere else but they might come back to you once you've proven that you know what you're talking about and you're and the best way to move forward with it with deals and you got to be okay with them kind of testing the water a little bit and and yeah you know you can really niche down and run numbers for them um but i find it's always best for investors are to learn how to run those numbers themselves Mm -hmm. You're doing a disservice if you're not teaching them how to do that for themselves in the future. Yeah, give some guidance. Hey, here's where I learned. Here's here's different ways to look at it. But it it's it's a lot to run the numbers for them, and they need to know what their goals are. And so part of that's education as well. Exactly. And have you found that? Um... Like, have you built a team, not like a team of agents necessarily, but a team around this industry? Like, do you have a lender that you can plug your investors into? Do you have a, a property manager that you can plug them into? Like, have you created that for your clients? Yes. Yeah, so I've been working on a, actually a team of, of showing agents as well, because we have people that come in and want to buy Western North Carolina. So they're looking high country, Boone, they're looking deep west, Bryson. We have some target areas in Western North Carolina specifically, Lake Lure, Mars Hill, Greater Asheville, Carson City Maggie around the National Park and the high country, um, Boone and Beach. And so having people you trust out there to show or split deals with, depending upon how you're structured, is really helpful to not run yourself ragged. Yeah. Um, outside of that, you know, most of these people really want to self-manage if they're going to make the most money because short-term yeah. rental investors specifically oh, um lost my earbud uh they're going to pay 20 to 25 percent to have somebody else manage that that's so a lot of that, profits those are, there are but they're all gone if you spend so if you that's what i'm saying that's a lot of money it. that like yeah. eats it up yeah so you know, do I have, yes, I have vacation rental management companies I could recommend them to, but most 
want to self-manage as long as they can yeah. until they build a bigger portfolio and want to pass it on. It's really not passive. People like to say it's passive, but you still got to be involved. You still have to put your, your things in place. Um, they have a couple different lenders, depending upon whether they're going to go DSCR or if they're going to go a different route for lending. Um, and then cleaners and people of that nature that I can recommend to reach out to. Um, but that's sort of a, a faster changing group of people to keep up with. So those are a rotating, a rotating group I can recommend. That's a good point. And it's so important. I work with some short, some um, investor clients as well. And the first thing they always ask me, especially if they're not in this market already, like if they're, you know, like I've got one now that they're investors in Charleston and they're investing in Western North Carolina now. Who's your favorite cleaners? It's, it's yes. such an important question because finding somebody that you can rely on, especially if you're an out-of-state investor, you need that. Um, so that's super valuable if that's something that you can provide to your clients. There's a variety um, I- of tools that I also recommend as being extremely helpful. And I might be jumping ahead on your, on your question. I have tools question on here. You are, <laughs> that's okay. Go ahead. <laughs> um, you know, air DNA, I pay for it for the state. I find that's extremely helpful because even if I recommend an agent for them to work for in a Boone or in a Bryson, and I could even run it if we're looking out in the, out in the coast and I have a, a an agent out there that I'm working with, it helps me get a larger percentage of the cut of the deal because they're still partially my client instead of yeah. pulling, referring them out. But then you can look at the cops that come up on Air D and Day and say, okay, this one's good. Okay, this one's not great. Let's adjust our numbers based upon this. Um, B and B Calc is another good one to really run your numbers deeply. It's it's all about the bottom line in a lot of these, unless, and there are the buyers out there, they're buying short-term rentals to be a second home that they'll use as well. And that yeah. is not a strictly investment buyer. That's a yeah. different buyer. And those are easier to find deals for because it's, they're not really looking for a deal. Yeah. They're looking for a house they can enjoy as well. I just want to get the mortgage covered or some of it covered. Um, so having these tools, there's there's a couple of them out there. Rabu is another one to kind of run across. Um, if you use the AirDNA, but you want to check another one, that's free and a good place to go. And I find that it's eighteen hundred dollars a year for the month for Air DNA for the state. But I find that people really value that, and not the value add that I can bring to the table and say yeah. yes hey, here's a resource. I work in this space. I'm comfortable in this space. Here's, I pay for this system. No, I'm serious about finding you a good deal and making sure we get you something that cash flows well. What was the one you mentioned? You said B&B what? B&B Calc. Is that a paid subscription? I think it's like $15 a year. It's not okay. expensive at all. Okay. B&B Calc. Okay. So one of the things that you mentioned is that you feel like you had to have a thick skin working with investors. The, the yeah. strongest feedback that I hear from other agents when they're working with investors is they get exhausted because they run mm-hmm. them around geographically all over the map. And you've already touched on that with having showing partners, but they also get exhausted because these investors are having them put in pennies on the dollar offers and it can wear an agent out. So what what are your thoughts around that? Like, do you... Do you put in the offers that your clients ask you to, even if that you in your mind are like, mm, this seems steep and I don't think that's going to fly? Like, or do you have some boundaries around that? Well, the short term rental space really in our area doesn't allow for under ask offers. Um, maybe in the last six to eight months, people have gotten away with a little bit more, but we keep it back up. And so that's just, you're going to put in under ask. Maybe I'll do one, but then we'll see how we get no response and we'll have a real you know, coming to Jesus conversation about what the, and, and it's like, maybe I'll put in one, you know, like, let's be, let's be realistic here. Let's yeah. you're purely bottom line. I'm going to be purely bottom line at the same, at the same yeah. way. Um, you know, the more cash buyers or fixer upper type of buyers. Yeah. You can put in, you know, mm-hmm. the under ask offers, but 
again, in our market, especially now, they're going to be competing with cash. They're going to be competing against hard money, hard money lenders, especially local ones that are going to be well known. And so if they're not a local person doing that, they're just, they're just not going to win. So perhaps if they want to go that route, they need to talk to the Alfies. They need to get in touch with the local hard money lenders to show yes, because it, it makes the other agent on the other side take you seriously as well. Yeah, and um, I just totally lost my train of thought on this one. Oh, but I think what's important for agents to remember when working with investors, and you just said to it, like you've kind of set your boundaries, you haven't come to Jesus, but what's important for agents to remember is like we're the market expert in our in our market. Mm -hmm. Like investors, they're, they're experts. They're experts in making money and understanding what they need to cash flow. But I think it's okay, and Abby, disagree with me if you want to. I think it's okay to like gently remind some of these clients like, yeah, but this is this is my wheelhouse, and I can tell you what probably what will and what won't work in this market. Yeah, I mean, client management is so big in investors because they will they'll want to look at anything, they'll be curious. They won't physically go out, but they want you to physically go out. That's not realistic. So if you're going to be all about the numbers, I'm going to be about it too. Let's have a real honest conversation. Let's see what your goals are. And let's see if this property is actually going to fit it. Otherwise, let's move on. A lot of them are fly by night, but easily distracted. And so saying, okay, you're very interested in this. Let's do a deep dive financially before we go show. And if you're not willing to do that, you're not showing seriousness in what you're, in what you're doing. And I'm not going to go take videos of something that you don't have seriousness about. Yeah. And so what would you, what would you recommend to some an agent, a new agent, or even an experienced agent who's just not worked with the, an investor client before? And I'm thinking specifically right now, like short-term rental investor clients, because they're so heavy in our area. What, what would you say to that agent to encourage them or to like, I've heard of so many agents, like I haven't worked with a short-term rental investor client before. Can I refer this out? Like, what would you encourage that agent to do? Well, decide if that's something you want to niche in or not. And don't be afraid to refer out. I mean, you you can do a couple, but you're going to learn real fast that they're going to run you ragged. And yeah. that's fine to do that, to feel, is this something I want to be involved with? Or is this not something I want to be involved with? But then, you know, dive in, do what it takes to be good at it or or get out. Don't, don't play halfway. Do it or or don't. Uh, that's my advice. I'm going to um, just grab my charger real quick, but I'll be here. You're welcome to ask questions okay. maybe from the group. Yeah. Does anybody have any questions right now? I've got a topic I'll just dive into if not. So in Abby, if you can still hear me, I hope, but you know, one of the things when I work with investor clients that I find is very different than working with a primary home buyer is I find that it just requires a lot more due diligence. I'm talking to the county. I'm talking to the city. I am having the attorney look at the deed and any restrictions and going back and looking at old deed restrictions. Is there, do you find the same thing? And is there anything else that would be, you know, for agents that are working, that are new to working with these investor clients, Anything else that they should be looking at in the due diligence period that they may not be looking at for a primary home buyer? Are you talking about after putting in an offer? Yeah, like once you're under contract. Once you're under contract. Yeah. Um, <laughs> so things that you wouldn't necessarily look at for a primary? Yeah, so like I find like checking with zoning and making sure mm -hmm. there's no um, regulation. And I would love to do that a lot of times prior to putting in an offer. But as we know, sometimes in our market, and if it's a good short-term rental property chances are there's already a deadline on it and you may not have an opportunity to speak to the necessary party so yeah sometimes we'll do that during due diligence yeah I mean I think you touched on it with the attorney that that is so important the HOA docs we got to find out who's the president of the HOA we got to find a temperature of the HOA are they going to change and dysregulate STRs in the near future you don't have yeah. to do that but that's what a good agent Mm -hmm. would do check with the city councils or go to the city council meetings get a feel for the temperature in those town meetings and that's not necessarily during due diligence but that's just being informed and up to date um, in our local market woodfin recently changed the rules and 
knowing the temperature of where the market, the, the area is going, is going to be really helpful. Ideally, you stay out of any kind of an HOA. Ideally, you stay out of a city limit mm-hmm. because you're much more likely to not have something come down in the county. Um, but you really, really got to be informed on a regulation to do service to your clients. Yeah, and one of the things that I've found too, and I'll just share from personal experience, just don't take the listing agent's word for it. There has been, I, we all mm-hmm. look at the listings where it'll say, short-term rentals allowed or no restrictions. I just would strongly encourage you to do your own due diligence in that regard. That's great advice because maybe they haven't called the HOA. Maybe they don't know if things are going to be changing in the near future because maybe it is allowed now, but perhaps they're already having conversation that's not going to be allowed in a month. Maybe they do know that and they don't, it's, they're not sharing it because they know it'll decrease the value for the home in the future or for, you know, they're selling their sellers, their client is selling because that is changing, but it hasn't changed yet. Um, You're right. Never take the list agent and what they say at face value and figure out for yourself. I think another big one we find in our area is septic systems and what that means for bedrooms and how many people that can actually accommodate. So mm-hmm. bringing, being super diligent about your septic inspections and saying, okay, could this be expanded? How big is the tank? Like really getting really gritty because if they want to maximize the property, they're going to want to put as many people in as they can that yeah. the house reasonably fits. And that might mean pumping more or it might mean expanding if possible. And, you know, really being on top of those sort of things is essential for the short-term rental space. Yep. And I learned that the hard way. Um, I say that, like, do your own research. because That's something I learned the hard way as a a newer agent in my first year. And um, at the end of the day, it was still my responsibility. Like, they were my buyer clients. I went with the listing agent word, and it was still my, it was my problem because I didn't double check. But anyway, so just do that due diligence. So the, like, I feel like right now, the other hottest topic just in the real estate market for realtors is lead gen um, and finding clients. So you, we've all heard the term, the riches are in the niches. Do you find that like, because you've niched down into something, like, is that the majority of your business? Do you find like you have a constant flow of you're filling your pipeline consistently because you've niched down? I'd say 50% of my business is And now short-term rentals have decreased somewhat from their height in the last year or two. So I'm seeing a little bit less of that, more people turning to midterm rentals or perhaps long-term. So making sure you have more than one exit strategy with your property is going to be super beneficial to ride out the ups and downs. We're seeing a really low occupancy right now, but I could see in 2025, Occupancy rate going back up as all the people that got in during the frenzy of 2020 and 2021 and 2022, realizing that uh, they don't like short-term rental management and wanting to yeah. get out. You know, um, really, really focusing on the properties that are unique and they are more expensive now in our market, but you're never going to be failed by views and you're never going to be failed by a creekside, you know, a cabin, but kind of thinking outside the box as far as that goes. I have totally lost what the question was. I'm sorry. <laughs> it was just like, we talk about, that's okay. It was still very informative. We we talk about, we all hear the phrase, the riches are in the niches. And I yes. think as I talk to agents right now, the biggest pain point for agents right now across the industry is lead gen. Lead gen. And so do you feel like you're fill, filling your pipeline because you have niched down? Yeah. So 50% is investors and yeah. Yes, the more I niche, the more the more I can create marketing that speaks to the niche. And um and being involved in real estate investing forums, creating events. I've got some of the pipeline geared towards investors and largely women investors. I think it's a somewhat ignored category. Um has help does help keep my pipeline fuller and keeps yeah. me in touch with those people and honestly it's they have similar goals to me so it's an easy match 
Yeah, it's an enjoyable it's, one. Yeah, why do a niche you don't enjoy? Yeah, and that's kind of part of the referral out too. It's like try it out, try a couple short term rental things. It will wear you out if you don't have your systems in place. Yeah, but if you don't enjoy it, pass it on. Take that twenty five percent and spend your energy and efforts marketing to the ones you do enjoy. Whatever that is, move ups, move downs you know whatever your niche is that is just pure gold that is great advice thank you for that <laughs> it really is because like i feel like sometimes like you know as agents we're just like the scarcity mindset i'll take anything like i'll take any deal whatever you're a va buyer great you're an investor and you want to put in thirty thousand dollar offers i just did that great like it's so it's not always the best tactic so thanks for sharing that Corey. uh cory who's listed as kimmy you got a question <laughs> Hi, I'm Kimmy number two. Um, <laughs> Abby, I love that because I always just want to refer out my short term rentals because it stresses me out because I don't know the numbers. Um, and it's so funny. I just got one last week and I was like, but I have this relationship with them. <laughs> I was like, Damn it. Hi, <laughs> my name is Abby. I'd love to help. Um, so yeah, so I'll be talking to you about that here in a little bit. Um, but also like, what do you do? My question is like in the follow-up. So you close on a property with them. What do you do in your follow-up to continue to add value to continue? Cause they'll probably want another property here in a little bit. Like what is, yeah. What does that look like? Yeah, that's great. I always, you know, a lot of it's similar to other follow-up that I do with regular clients. Okay, it's tax time. I'm going to mail you all your tax documents with a picture of my face. Um, just oh, that's reaching great. out. Yeah, keeping in touch and say, hey, how's your property going? Can I refer a maintenance person? Do you need a new cleaner? How is your lawn care? Trying to always provide value, maybe every two months. Do you need a professional service I can recommend? Have you had any plumbing issues? How is your self-management? Do you want information about other management companies to see what that might look like if it's too much for you? They will buy regularly. I have somebody that bought in November that wants to buy again in six months as long as the numbers work. So stay in touch whatever it is whatever makes sense whether it's a tax documents holiday things investment like maybe there's a tax law coming down the pipeline i don't know how many of you and this is not necessarily investment related but the fha is changing its down payment requirement or its pmi requirements that's come on the pipeline it's really going to affect first-time home buyers how many of you are passing that along to your first-time home buyers if that's your niche you know find those things if it's something a niche you're passionate about it's probably a niche that you're keeping information up on share it Keep a, keep a text relationship, make a phone call and ask pertinent questions that you would want to be at as you are building your portfolio. Cause they're excited. They, they just, they love this shit. <laughs> yeah. Love it they with them. Deal. <laughs> yeah. They always want a deal. Maybe you see a great um, property and you're like, oh, this made me think of you. Is this a, is this a, is this a property you would consider in the future? Do you feel the responsibility to take on identifying what is a good investment and what is not? Uh, that's a great question. I do to a certain point in that I make sure that there are the uniqueness attributes, the long range views, the creek set, you know, depending upon whatever market you're in, yeah. close to XYZ amenities. 20 minute Uber from Asheville, Lake Lore, whatever it is, is that that thing but outside of that? I don't. If they don't know how to run their numbers, how serious an investor are they? And that's where it's like I point them to the resources to learn to run it. And if they're not willing to do that, they're not willing to actually buy. A big issue with this clientele is analysis paralysis. Mm -hmm. They'll want you to go look at 20 properties. Are they ever going to pull the trigger? I don't know. So if they're not willing to put in the effort, I'm not willing to as well. It's not my job to do that for them. 
Yeah, I keep hearing this with you, and I think it's so important is you are pretty, you have pretty strong boundaries with these clients. Um, you know, like what you will do. It's the only way to survive them, honestly. Yeah, that's kind of what I'm hearing. And I'm telling you, I like that is the bit when I talk to other agents about like, do you work with investors? Do you want to work with investors? Oh, they're the worst. They run me, they wear me out, you know, but it sounds like you found a way to make money with them and, you know, preserve your sanity at the same time. Yeah, there's a there's a loyalty level that you can give to them, but they've got to they've got to give it back. And yeah, if they're not willing to put in the effort, I can't put it in for them. You can't want it more than your clients. You can't want it more than your clients. So make yeah. sure they know how to do it. They're taking the steps. You're guiding along with them, and then you know provide the support appropriate for the amount of effort they're putting in. Can you talk about some of the unique ways that you help find a good property for your client? Because you're like master MLS scourer. <laughs> I don't know about that. Withdrawn. Like you really I are. Do, I feel like you're pretty good about this. I do love to hunt expires withdrawn for sale by owners. And that might just be like it's a puzzle. I don't know if there's any real tips or tricks I can give outside of keep an eye keep an eye on that thing just don't be afraid to cold call those people and I don't know there's no secret hey, I got a buyer or I might have a buyer like are you still interested in selling is that kind of how your conversation starts oh yeah absolutely yeah I've got a you know I've got a buyer client looking for a property just like yours you know let's talk about it and if it doesn't work for your buyer client, you may have just maybe just picked up a seller. That would be ideal. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so that kind of leads me into my next question. I have just a few more um, and then we'll open it up. Do you find that working with investors, is it pretty buyer heavy? I think as a somewhat newer agent, it always starts buyer heavy. Yeah. Um, so yes you know, for me is maybe if you get a, a client that's been working with investors for 10, 15 years, they're seeing more turnover. Sure. Um, but different investors will have different goals on what kind of returns they want and how they're measuring those. And so my mine have tend to be longer holders. Let's, let's get as much money out of this as possible until there's a tipping point and it makes more sense to reinvest it based on the equity. So largely, yes. Yeah. I've been by Okay. I have, I have sold a couple of short term rentals, um, but so far, most of the buyers. So, how do you fill your pipeline with your investor clients? Where do you find them? Um, I'm a big, bigger pockets person. Um, and there's some local meetups. Uh, yeah. Priya is also around here. I don't go to that as much. Um, you start getting a lot of referrals once you start working with investor clients, but being present on forums, talking about the deals you're doing, talking about, you know, deals you're helping other people with answering questions. Like it's, it's not a secret that the best way to provide value is to, or become trusted is to provide value. It's yeah. the same thing in the investor world. Somebody's got a question on 1031. Hey, here's the best place that I found to do it. I did one recently. I also find it being super a helpful as being a resource, but also continuously buying investments myself is the best way to share what's going on and to pick up more leads because I can talk about what I'm doing and it can prove like I've done this myself recently. So that's why that's part of the reason why I have the goal of picking up two more properties myself um, this year. That's fantastic. So what can, um, if agents are interested in getting into this market, whether it's short-term, medium-term, long-term, do you have any like things that they can study or learn or certifications, classes, anything that you recommend? Like, what did you dig into to really, I know that you're doing it yourself, like you are an investor, but like what resources did you use to really educate yourself on the process and the loans out there? I really was heavy, 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 bigger pockets. And I know there's a bunch of different podcasts out there, but that for me, as I listened to that podcast, every time I mowed the lawn for a year and a half before I became an agent and, um, you know, 
want to learn how to invest, buy one because you're going to be super interested in making sure you make money and you're going to make mistakes and you'll learn how to tell people or show people how to not make those mistakes. So my biggest education has been, I mean, it's an incredible amount of resources there. They write books, there's forums, there's multiple podcasts. Now it was just the one. Now it's like, there's investing ones, there's, there's beginner investment ones. There's the, um, there's a short-term rental one. Um, that, that has been my biggest education is buying them myself and then listening to podcasts and forums about them. But, you know, I, I'm just going to be the dead horse of saying, be passionate about yourself and you will want to learn. It will not feel like a chore. It will feel like it's what I want to do and what I want to help other people do. Um, yeah. yeah, I think that's that's important. It's like, don't put a square head peg in a round hole, right? Like if this is not your jam, don't force it. Yeah, you know? move on. Yeah, find what is your jam. So that has been great. That is a ton of really good information. I really appreciate you sharing it. Does anyone else have any questions or comments for Abby before we let her go? Because I think she's got a meeting at four. I so appreciate this. This is awesome, Abby. Nice to yeah. hear from you in this. I mean, you know, we talk on the regular, but it was nice to hear this and hear some great questions. Oh, thank you. Can I say my recommendation for everybody is to pull a HELOC on your primary? <laughs> Girl. <laughs> recommendation for everybody. I'm taking pull my HELOC. feet upstairs. You can say to Anthony. <laughs> <laughs> oh my God. That I do I do talk this significant others regularly I'm like <laughs> hey can you talk to my spouse and sometimes it's husband sometimes it's wives, sometimes it's significant <laughs> others I yeah. talk to my spouse <laughs> we and we, always, we did uh, it but I you know expensed everything so I only made like ten dollars so we had to base it off of Xander's salary <laughs> so I guess we could get like a ninety ninety thousand dollar mobile home yeah, there, I mean, that's a, are you saying that you net have no, no, no income? Yeah, I had no income, right, because I expensed everything, but we did get 90,000, so we can do something with that, right, something. <laughs> you can have a yeah. DSCR loan. Yeah, you can get a DSCR loan, those are going to be more expensive um, interest rates, but the goal is always uh, refinance out of them. The best thing you can do right now, if you can manage it, in my opinion, the cheapest money is an arm. A primary primary loan arm. Now you have to buy it as your primary and turn your past one into a rental, which not everybody's going to do, but that's the cheapest money that I am aware of at the moment. Turn my, right. current, turn my current house into a rental? do it oh yeah no not <laughs> i love this yeah, I am so here you're too that. emotionally attached <laughs> i am so emotionally attached to this <laughs> no i will send you the one i will text you i won't like take up zoom bandwidth to show you this but i 15 minutes before this call sent one to anthony i said let's move and str because i was talking to abby last week i looked at my str numbers like well shouldn't have looked at those because now i'm like where are we going <laughs> <laughs> yeah we bought a new construction home in april 2021 and just scouted another house to buy this weekend i don't know if we're gonna pull the trigger we went kind of bougie on this last one and i'm really comfortable but when you look at what you can rent for and the equity you have in this market it, it's it really expensive not to do it i, <laughs> I mean that's not a like a regular okay also i guess my other piece of advice if you haven't read it for dad basic investment advice you can give the dead for dad buy assets not liabilities that's why i drive somewhat of a clunker paint's chipping off two hundred thousand miles but i have a bunch of property and just laid out my assets for my estate planning and uh we're looking pretty good that's, that's awesome. great I've heard a few people recommend Rich Dad Poor Dad, so I'll add that one. In my I read article. about half of it. You don't like have to read all of it, and also Richard Kiyosaki is a political figure, so just push that 
away if you don't believe what he talks about. I got it. Well, that was super. Abby, thank you for sharing. I think this is so great yeah. to get to know you better. Um, you had huge success. And for everybody who does not, I know most of you on this call, but anybody that's going to watch this recorded, Abby, you know, has been in this for three years and she didn't toot her own horn, but she's had massive success um, yes. as a newer agent. So it has worked for her. The proof is in the pudding. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, y'all. This has been great. I really appreciate it. Yeah, everybody have